I'm having breakfast with my kids this morning, and I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, two boys. And they're asking me what I'm doing home, and am I going to New York today? And I said, yeah, I'm going to talk at a conference today. And my, my older son says, oh, that's sad. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, that's because he wants to spend more time with me, and I was having breakfast, which I normally do. But actually, uh, I said, well, son, well, why, why do you think that's sad? Thinking I'm going to get some great dad moment. And he goes like, it's really sad that all those people had to pay to hear you talk. <laughs> so, I, uh, so I immediately told him their, uh, Santa Claus wasn't real <laughs> and, and that I've, uh, I love his uh, younger brother more than him. So context is extremely important. Um, those slides aren't great on the screen, but the context is incredibly important. So I'm going to talk about my context a little bit. So I've been working in software testing for about 20 years, a little more, uh, mostly in what I call enterprise IT. So this is large financial service organizations, insurance companies, telecommunications, non-technical companies that build software. That's my context. So last night um, before the uh, meetup, we were, I was having dinner with a couple folks, and we were talking about trading horror stories about what it's like working in the enterprise IT world. And a lot of folks, I saw somebody tweet today, where are these companies that like testers aren't respected? I'm like, they work with me, right? <laughs> they work in large financial services organizations. So, and so that's my context. It's where you know, we're building software for companies that aren't software organizations. Um, and so with that, I'm going to give you a bit of a disclaimer and I think particularly when you're at a conference and you're hearing people talk, a lot of people, and some of them actually like to wear T-shirts that call themselves experts. And uh, it's really important to know, and I love this quote from Daniel Kahneman, if you haven't read uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, you should. People who think they're experts could possibly be in the grip of an illusion. Um, and so being, I never call myself an expert. I have some experience, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. So anything you're going to hear today or from me, or I would say probably in general, should be met with a healthy dose of skepticism. Don't take what I'm telling you is true. It's true for me, uh, but it may not be true for everybody else. So um, with, with that, I'm going to talk today about my experiences of working 20 years in enterprise IT. Two years ago, I quit my job. Uh, with Barclays Investment Bank to start up a software testing practice with a startup uh, based on context-driven uh, context principles. And so one of the things I think as well, people should uh, differentiate to or between exclusively is what is in your opinion and what is in your experience. So I'm going to break this talk down into two parts, stuff that's my opinion and stuff that I've experienced as well. And I think if you're, and I'm constantly trying to fine tune my BS detector, people who use my opinion and my experience interchangeably are probably uh, full crap. So the first thing that I would say when I quit my job and started this practice is probably not uh, more of a lesson that I learned, because there's four key lessons that I learned, but it's it's more of an observation, and that observation was, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And, ah, oh, that feels good to say that, doesn't it? Say, say it with me, all together, right? I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, right? And, and the reason why I didn't know that, sorry, Rosie, uh, the reason why I, I, I didn't know that is because 20 years of being in investment banking and working in technology and enterprise has hardened my brain a little bit that they primarily do things because they want to keep their job and I'm setting their comp. So turning the paradigm around a little bit where I was working with people to, uh, th to work setting their compensation to do my ideas I was actually working with people to set my compensation to do better ideas about t testing. And that's a fundamental difference and is much harder to do uh, when they've got a vested interest in whether or not you get business. So the first lesson that I really learned, and I think maybe relearned or maybe learned how bad it was, is that people still don't discuss why they're testing. And 
I think that starts at the top and culture gets set at the pointy end of the stick. And I've talked a lot about executives and C-level folks who don't understand the value of testing. And I think we're all bad at, at talking about testing and quality. But from the ground up, we don't know why we're doing things. And there's a big tendency, particularly in technology, towards tool fetishes, I think people have called it, or answering the question of can we do it instead of should we do it. And I've reviewed lots and lots of projects, lots of automation work, and very rarely have I seen a team get past the first question of what would happen if we didn't run this automation pack? If you can't answer that question, you're not thinking about why you're doing things the right way. You should be able to tell people why you run any test and what value it's giving to the business, and we're particularly bad about that. That thinking leads to another problem, which is essentially how, and I think, you know, to quote the movie, as I get older, I stereotype because it's more efficient, this is how I would describe most folks' approach to test management, poking a robot with a stick. And to kind of paraphrase James Bach, they don't really want a robot, they actually want to build like a fleshy thing that looks like a human like a robot, and then you go inside that thing, and then you act like the human as the robot. You know, and people think, if you, all I need to do is poke that testing robot a little bit more with my metric stick, and I'm going to get a better result. Um, and, and this thinking is pervasive uh, in, in testing still. No matter how cool kind of techie company you work at, this stuff is pervasive in our business. And I think, and I won't call anybody out, but I was just reading some testing literature of sponsors of a certain conference we all might have heard about very recently, talking things about never miss a bug. Um, that's what this thinking drives. That's what that creates. That's what language like that creates. The other lesson that I learned is that because we don't understand why we're testing, and that turns into a management approach that essentially makes us robots, our culture and our response to that as a testing community is to go further apart from, our, from the rest of the team. And there's still a culture in the, the testing industry that it's a specific role. And it might be a role. I think it's an activity, but it might not necessarily have to be a specific role. But we tend to recede from that and create our new language and create different ways of talking about things. Or we get really lazy about language and we use words inappropriately to try and give ourselves an identity that separates ourselves from the rest of the group because we're worried about keeping our jobs and worried about being valued. And that's, that's a, a, a big root cause of this problem is creating a third culture. And you see this a lot in heavy, we talked about outsourcing earlier, in organizations that use outsourcing extensively is you think that there's your company's culture, your vendor's culture, but what actually really gets created is a third culture as well as people who are kind of trapped in between those two. And lastly, when we talk about context-driven testing specifically, people always ask me repeatedly, and this is probably one of the last times I'm gonna talk about it, why aren't there more context-driven testing folks in management? Why aren't there more people with a testing pedigree in management, and this is the primary reason why. Because our community, in general, is looked at as a bunch of smarty pants. And I've witnessed a lot of conversations of passive aggressive correcting people's language. And I was talking about a specific example last night where somebody was saying QA, and then the person said, repeated what they said back, but said testing. And then they were like, yes, well, we're gonna QA that. He's like, yes, well, when we test that, and it went back and forth, and you know what that does? It just pisses everybody off. <laughs> and I don't think we need, to, I'm, I'm not in favor of mindlessness. And I'm, I appreciate being specific about language. And being pedantic is about getting to a common understanding of what words mean. And that's super important when you want to understand what people are referring to when they talk about quality or value. But we don't want to do it to the point where we're just irritating people. Um, and I've worked with, a lot of test leads, and I was actually really shocked at the maturity level 
So at Barclays, I grew my own test leads. When I got out of Barclays, I brought in a lot of test leads. And frankly, I was a bit shocked by the maturity level of people in the context-driven testing community who either interviewed with me or wanted to work with me as test leads. And folks who have test case allergies. If you say the word test case, they start breaking out in hives, right? And I think particularly in my context, if you want to be a consultant, you know, you need to think of yourself as a doctor and not a well visit doctor. People are going to you because they're sick, right? So they're not going to use appropriate language. They're not going to, they need help along that way. But you can't just come in with a, a, a surgical, you know, Civil War era saw every time somebody doesn't like, you don't like a word somebody uses. So, if people have been through my software testing class before, I use this slide to, does people know, everyone know what this is? So this is Everest, and at about 28,000 feet is what's known as the Hillary Step. So the first time Sredman Hillary and Tenzig Norgay summited Everest, they go up 28,000 feet to a 40-foot sheer rock face. And so, of course, you get there and you think you're at the 28,000 feet and, oh, fuck, right? So then they, you know, they're not using modern crampons and top roped and ladders like the people do now. No oxygen. So they get to the top of what then was just a rock face. Now it's known as the Hillary Step. And get to the top and they're like, hey, we're here. Oh, my God, it's a 1,000 more feet of just the slowest drudgery to a false summit and then one more summit. And that's how I use as a metaphor to describe a career in software testing. And, <laughs> and this is what I do when I'm training people. Um, and the reason why that is is because, and I didn't realize, and I thought, again, with my smarty pants hat on, that didn't apply to me. And boy, was I wrong. Um, and that exactly applied to me, because I was got to a point of my year of working 20-odd years in this business that I thought that I was just helping other people learn about it. And I was actually at a Hillary step myself. And so uh, as I got to the top of that and realized I still have more drudgery to go through, here are some things in my experience that are related to kind of those new lessons that I've learned or relearned or got new uh, uh, perspective on that can help with that. And the first one being, how do you align what you're doing? So if you're not asking why and, you're not, and you want to start adding more value, in my experience, this is how you should align everything you do. If you can't draw a direct line between something you're doing that somebody's paying you for and how it directly impacts the bottom line or profitability of your business, in my experience, you're doing it wrong. You should be able to describe and articulate how your tests help protect the business, help uh, increase market share, whatever your business objectives are, the business is what we're there for, right? Technology objectives below that, program objectives below that, any kind of fancy testing defect predictinators you want to put in um, come next, and then you. And, and again, in my experience, to add a lot of value to the business that they then either reward you for or is helping drive positive improvements is how this should be aligned. The next one, test management is 80% hands-on. And I think the, the biggest threat to value in, our organ, in the testing business is what I refer to as an operational test management role. If you work in a real cool techie company, you probably haven't encountered this. But outside in the cold, hard world of enterprise technology, it's like you can't swing a cat without hitting one. That's for you, Mark. We're, you're swinging cat. Um, and what they are are managers of managers or I like to refer to them as the coloring in boys. They just do metrics reports, right? These are folks who just manage testing, but a test manager should be spending 80% of their time actually testing. And how I describe that is, I don't know, actually testing, but also mentoring, peer reviews, pairing with people, coaching other folks. These are hands-on activities that get people better at, at, at testing and, and deliver more value to the organization. This thing in and of itself, I think there's so many people that strive, and I think the, uh, the way management structures are organized, 
that the further you go up in the organization, the farther you get away from your craft. And, and I think that's just fundamentally wrong. If it's taking more than 20% of your time to manage a team, you're, there's something wrong about how you're doing that or how the organization is, is, is organized. Um, and, you know, I, at Barclays, I had around 1,500 testers working for me. I managed that entire organization with five full-time managers. Everybody else was at the test lead level, and they all tested 80%. Some folks had teams of 50 to 100 people, and they still tested 80% of the time. So it can be done. If you want to drive a closer harmony between testing the rest of the team and you, these are some good heuristics for me that I use when I'm looking at organizations that are what I call a high-performing test function. The first one being if you're using outsource, never let it get above 70%. I would prefer 40, 60, and I actually run an outsourcing test company, but my advice to clients is don't ever get it between above 70 because then you're really gonna fall victim to that third culture, the us, them, and, and, and or you, them, and us. I don't know what a center of excellence is. I don't really care. I've been sold them for the last 20 years. I've never bought one, but thinking that testing is something that can be abstracted and centralized across a group and somehow has some kind of extra value in that way. Um, I, that's more about, I think, empire building and how you want to organize things to have a big team than about actually providing any real value to, to an organization. Um, refocus what, why you're doing things and asking those questions regularly. If you have an outsourced team, talk to them, meet with them regularly. If you are part of a larger team, it requires such a high level of communication to do it well. Uh, a lot of people really just want to get back to their desk and not talk to folks, but it requires a lot of communication. I'm not a big fan of the kind of suite of testing metrics out there, but my view is, particularly if you're being held to a special set of testing metrics or your organization wants to measure you differently, um, my advice would be to find out how they're measuring the rest of the organization and your measurement should be derived from that. So I very much doubt that people are asking developers to count lines of code or do function point analysis. So there isn't much added value to then counting, counting test cases and if you're wondering we deal with this every single day. There are still lots and lots and lots of organizations that are still asking people to count test cases and drive some kind of meaning from that. Um, so my advice would be is don't have a special set. Take your overall set and see how you support that. Um, if you want to get over, I'm trying to be conscious of the time here, Mark. If you want to get over smarty pants syndrome, right? And I think there's a difference between you know, I've probably been accused of being rough or sharp elbows in the past. I think that's different, probably because we're talking about me, than being a smarty pants. <laughs> but I think if you're, you know, to, to Dan's talk earlier, which I really enjoyed about all the techniques that he's now forever screwed with everyone he wants to try and get something over on in the future. Um, <laughs> coming to a discussion from a position of humility and and looking at it from what am I going to learn or take away from this, organ from this discussion, I think really diffuses a lot of talks. Also being self-aware about what am I contributing to this problem. People, I think in general, want to put out a quality product. They want testing to, to, to add to that. They may not understand testing in the same way that you do or study it that way you do. If you're having issues with developers or people not valuing what you do, talking to folks in terms of, hey, you know, what, what am I doing to contribute to this problem? I want to, when, when we had that discussion, I felt like you were, you know, upset with what I said or it was clearly causing issues. What am I doing to, to do that, to, to help move beyond those issues? And really taking a humble approach and particularly, you know, there's, it, we're, we're a bit short of it, I think, at times in the context-driven testing community um, of, of humility. And there are some great ideas and thinkers, but you know, I think to a certain extent we need to rethink our outreach uh, program um, because we, we, we can't put people off uh, with being a bit too harsh on use of language and, and how we talk about stuff. 
Um, and the last point there I'm going I'm to say is being context aware. And I think that's slightly different from being context driven. And what I've seen over the last couple years trying to hire and grow context driven testers is they still look at it as a set of tools or a set of techniques. Or if you are a context driven tester, you only do exploratory testing or that there's some kind of balance, you're, or like a ratio you're looking for. And the biggest contributor to your context is what? People, right? The biggest context is, is, is people. And if you don't understand the people, exploratory testing might not work in your organization and not making a value judgment on that, is that wrong? We're actually working with a client right now where we're talking about possibly doing things a bit more waterfallish because of the reg implications of what they're doing and trying to shoehorn an agile model into that just isn't going to work. Uh, and I see too much of people, you know, trying to turn context-driven testing into, you know, you have to use mind maps, right? You have to know the heuristic test strategy model. And that's not really it. It's making the right decisions for the context that you're in. We tend to forget the big part, the first step of that is being aware of the actual context that you're in. Lastly, if you're not going to do any of that, manage your own expectations. I say it again and again and again. People, uh, there, there seems to be a pervasive feeling that I'm just going to keep hitting the employer reset button until I find the right job that's right for me. They just didn't get me. I w they didn't like the way I did things. Um, and, you know, the saying that the, the only thing that common denominator in all your dysfunctional relationships is you. And if you're not going to listen to the things that were said today and adapt those and take them on and learn from it, I think you should manage your expectations down that you're not going to have as much success as you possibly could have. So with that, thank you. Dear Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. That was awesome. Thank you. Yes, Any and he dro dropped no? an F-bomb. So, Emma. I did. And I got them all to say it, It too. goes out to Emma. That's good. You're all recorded now. Yes. And I was by actually the... pissed off because Siggy said it first. And I was saying I was going to get to do the first no, one. I'm sorry. But, maybe, you know, maybe next year. Disappointment. Yes. Thank you, Keith. That was awesome. Um,